Hi, I'm David Ferbata with Agribusiness Global. Today, we're talking about fall armyworm spread and control options around the world with Dr. Robert Bertram. He's chief scientist of USAID's Bureau of Resilience and Food Security, which is charged with advancing nutrition and food security around the world. In that capacity, he's working with the FAO's recently established Global Action for Army Worm Control, for which he serves as chair of the technical committee. Dr. Bertram, thank you for your time today. Pleasure. Let's start by defining the problem just a little bit. Uh, Fall army worm was once relegated to the Americas. It's since spread to Asia and Africa. Um, Tell us just a bit about how big this problem is and what uh, regions are being affected most. Well, you're absolutely right, David. It was a pest in the Americas, which we knew how to learn how to handle. We call it fall army worm because it used to migrate uh, long distances where it was year round in Florida, for example, and then it would reach Michigan and Minnesota by the fall. And uh, that fact is key to the fact that once it was introduced into Africa about 40 years ago, five years ago, uh, it's been able to spread all across that continent, up to the Middle East and Egypt, east into South Asia, India, Pakistan, eventually into East Asia, and just this past year into Australia. So it's a remarkably mobile pest. It can migrate up to 700 kilometers, and the generations are rapid. So this makes it, uh, 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 it's a brand new challenge for those parts of the world. And as you know, some of those parts of the world are the parts of the world where farmers are the poorest and least able to adapt to a new threat, a new pest. Uh, and of course, it's unknown uh, there. It's, uh, it, it is causing huge losses. Um, unlike uh, locusts, and you know, we've heard a lot about the locust plagues over the past year, but unlike locusts, Fall armyworm can cause just as much damage, but it's over a much wider area. It's not a single swarm. So it's a much more diffuse kind of problem, but nevertheless, a very large one that's affecting livelihoods, food security, even food safety. We can talk about that and and, and affecting uh, uh, millions and millions of people across Africa and Asia and people who are, in many cases, the least able to adapt to any additional threat to their food security and well-being. And this is an endemic problem now because of its ability to reproduce, correct? You're absolutely right. It's not going anywhere. This is not about eradication. Sometimes we can think about that, not with this pest. So the pest is, is there. Uh, we, are in, we have been actively partnering with uh, researchers and uh, institutions in both the public and private sectors both in the Americas, where the bulk of the expertise is on this pest, North and South America, but also in the countries where it's now uh, uh, endemic. And in our first, our first efforts were really about leveraging the knowledge from places like Brazil, the tropics, Florida. Uh, we got experts from, from around the US, USDA, universities to help bring that to the counterparts in Sub-Saharan Africa and then subsequently in Asia. So that was a, a first step we undertook. Uh, but now uh, as time goes on, it's more about, okay, what do we do to adapt to the pest now that we're learning more about it in, the, in these new contexts where it is? The FAO is citing um, that Africa is potentially losing 18 billion in crop losses. Do we have any other metrics that can tell us um, just how how widespread or how pervasive this is in, in ag systems? We do, we can say overall that it's taking out about 10% of Sub-Saharan Africa's maize crops. The valuation of that is variable, but that's about the same as the uh, uh, hit from uh, the locusts. Uh, and of course, 10% doesn't sound like it's a, a wipeout, but it can be, that's the problem. It's not everywhere. The weather, the weather conditions, if you have a lot of rain, there's less issues with the pest. If there's not as much rain, you can have a very severe outbreak. And one of the challenges we have with it is that 
it's it's a very insidious pest. It shows up. It's, you have to really know what to look for, and then it gets into the inside the plant in the oral or in the ear, where you can't get at it. So you have to you have to be uh, uh, fast on the on the draw. And this is of course where, uh, in many situations, access to information, access to biocontrol, chemical control, may be lacking. But it's uh, it's certainly in the billions of dollars. Uh, I don't know that we have estimates yet for Asia, but it, again, it, it's going to be very large. The other thing that's important to point out is that it's not restricted to maize. It goes after sorghum. There's also a rice biotype of the pest. Many of us are fearful that somehow either the current pest could adapt to rice in Asia and Africa, or that a rice biotype could become introduced. That would be a terrible blow because uh, you know, the rice crop, like maize crop, is a, a staple for many parts of the, uh, of the world. Well, let's talk about what we're doing to help control this. Um, the FAO started the Global Action for Army Worm Control Program December 2019, so we've got about a year under our belt now. Um, what are What is that program focused on, and how's it going? Great. Well, it is, it is FAO, and this is something that USAID, the Agency for International Development, and others, uh, particularly our counterparts in Norway, had, had advocated for FAO to play a key role, as they have around some other pests. This, this is the Food and Nor Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. So the global action is basically uh, trying to equip those countries that are where this pest is new with the information that they need to combat it. So this, I talked earlier about leveraging the knowledge that exists in, in, uh, in, in the North and South America. Starting several years ago, we started a Research for Development Alliance. This was a partnership between universities, uh, USDA was a member, ourselves, uh, and, and uh, FAO helped sponsor it. And that was to really try to build the evidence base in Asia and then, I mean, in Africa and then Asia and the Middle East. And so we've learned in that, in that process and we're using what we've done under the global action is distill the knowledge, both from what we know in the Americas, but also from what we're learning overseas. What kinds of varieties are resistant? Transgenic maize, biotech maize, totally resistant. So for example, farmers in South Africa or Vietnam or Philippines are growing that and they don't have to spray for this pest. Uh, we have uh, bio information on biological control, uh, good agricultural practice. So the, the technical committee, which I lead, has worked this year to pull all this together and, and to synthesize it in a way that's going to make it accessible both to uh, sophisticated partners, but we also want to have that information available for, for farmers. Because as I said, this is a pest, unlike locusts where you attack it centrally, plains and such, here you have to have millions of smallholder farmers acting based on good information, access to control. Uh, uh, uh. Early warning is not a big issue in this pest as it is because it tends to be endemic. So you, it, it, and it, and it, because it migrates so far, if it shows up, it's a pretty good bet it's gonna be all over the place very soon. But, but all of those things matter. For in areas where it's migratory, being able to have some ability to say when it's, when it's migrated in uh, will be important. So all of these kinds of knowledge in, uh, products and um, access, I guess that's the other issue David, is that we think about the policies. You know, some of the new chemistries that are available are safer than some of the older pesticides, especially in the developing country where pesticides are not well regulated often and uh, people don't necessarily have all the knowledge. They may be illiterate, so they can't read all the instructions. So these, this is, our work is about giving better options sooner to uh, equip countries but also the farming communities within them to uh, adapt to this new pest. 
Let's get deeper into some of those recommendations that are coming out of the technical committee. Um, you're, you're providing support to national task forces um, and you're coming up with specific protocols and IPM strategies. Can you get into some of the details about the hallmarks of some of those programs, uh, understanding that some of them are, are, are region specific? Yes, and, and I should say, I think it's fair to say that a lot of this is work in progress. So we've had this research for development partnership that's been going after a range of different approaches, agroecological management practices, uh, biological control, chemical control using both biopesticides and synthetic pesticides, better germplasm. Uh, uh, so, so in those, what we've done is we have uh, aggregated those in a, in a table that's soon to be available that uh, shows we've categorized them in three ways. One are the good agricultural practices, using good seed, the best seed available, healthy seed, uh, soil fertility management, soil water management. You know, an unstressed plant is going to be more resistant to pest attack. Than a, uh, than a plant that's highly stressed. So they, uh, the, uh, that's the, there's one group of that. And then there's a group that's more about pesticides, uh, uh, agri um, uh, other kinds of control methods uh, that can be used. And, and some of the, we've tried to aggregate those uh, biopesticides, biological control methods that are de have been demonstrated. We tried to, use evidence to guide all our work. In other words, we're not, there's a lot of things out there, but we want to make sure that we're giving quality information for our partners who can then adapt it in their own settings through demonstration trials, possibly through research trials. And then we have a third category that is, um, that is uh, where areas where there are aspirational kinds of approaches, that don't have evidence yet, that we don't have enough evidence or that maybe they've worked somewhere else but not on this particular pest, or they, they can't go to scale. I mean, some, for example, you can encounter situations where people will say, well, people could handpick these caterpillars. This isn't feasible to do. You'd spend all your time, if you're a farmer growing a couple hectares of maize, you, it's just not feasible to be out there picking off thousands and thousands of these uh, critters. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a, uh, it's a uh, you have to be realistic about what can scale. So we've taken all those kinds of things and we've also categorized them by safety, efficacy, compatibility with biological control, uh, ac cost, access. So we've tried to provide and the access in terms of policy and markets, are they there? And policies, you know, I mentioned biotechnology crops, but there's also policies around plant protection. And some of some countries have restrictive rules of pro bureaucratic processes that have to go through to bring a new product to market, have to be gone through, excuse me. And, and uh, if, if, if those aren't there, we can tell people about this, but we have to say that this isn't available everywhere. So we've tried to help people not have to reinvent the wheel in each location, but rather to benefit from the global knowledge and then adapt, be in a position to adapt to their local situation. So you hit on this um, briefly. Um, are control options available to farmers, considering this is a new pest? Um, some of their legacy chemistries likely are applicable, but some new ones might be more effective. Um, you talked about the difficulty in the fragmented regulatory system. Um, what, what is the role of private, in, uh, private enterprise in helping make technologies available um, to combat these and other pests? It's, it's very important. And we have seen uh, the development of new chemistries and approaches, seed treatments, for example, that confer resistance for the first six weeks or so or two months of the plant's life. 
that's an extremely critical period in which to protect the plant from attack. So that that allows the crop to get off to a good start. It's not necessarily widely available yet. It is some places, but and, and because it's new, it has to go through um, a regulatory review in some countries. And of course, in a continent like Sub-Saharan Africa, you have lots of small countries. So you can imagine the hurdles. Uh, so this is why, uh, th another work that we do in AID, we work with our partner countries and regions to try to harmonize uh, systems such that if a seed variety is released in two countries in East Africa, all the rest of the countries will adopt it, that sort of thing. Well, the same kind of thing can be thought about in, in this space. But so, so there are, um, there are, uh, uh, there's a virus based uh, spray from California that's really exciting and, and but again it's expensive and it's not available everywhere um, but these things are far preferable to as you said some of the legacy chemistries and often these are chemistries that no longer are used in, in, in Europe or North America or Australia for example so that combined with misuse or uh, uh, misapplication, you know, misapplication or lack of personal protective equipment. Everybody in the world knows what PPE is, but for those in the plant protection, crop protection industry, PPE has been household terminology for a long time, and that's often lacking in the, the context where we are. So the the best, you know, the good good agricultural practice, good seed. We are getting non-transgenic based sources of resistance. They're not as good as the transgenic resistance that farmers in the Americas use, North and South America, but they help. Uh, so there's a range of things that can be done, but it, um, uh, it, 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 it requires judgment. It requires the farmer being able to see the problem and then try to uh, uh, use an appropriate approach. And he or she, Unfortunately, in many situations, their choice is limited for a number of reasons. Are you seeing um, private enterprises increasing their registrations of new products in some of these markets that need them? Are, are they answering the call? Yes, I think some of them are. It's a good business uh, uh, practice. You know, to, to, they want to grow the business and they want to bring these better products to the farmers, we are also working to try to uh, 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 enhance the uh, regulatory uh, enabling environment such that it will be more uh, cost effective for, for uh, uh, the private sector to come and invest. And of course, they don't just invest in the products, then they invest in the, the, the value chains through, they work with stockists, with uh, agro, agro dealers to get the information as well as the product, uh, make it available. So yes, we, 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 I think the industry has responded. There are new products, they are getting used, uh, uh, but getting those to the last mile, getting those to the farmers, the family in Malawi where a woman is you know, raising five children and has about a, an acre of land, that's a tough one. And, and that's where, um, you know, unfortunately, people often have to fall back on, on whatever uh, control methods are available. Are there a handful of active ingredients or active substances that you wish you had, uh, you could make available to um, regions that are, are combating this? You mentioned the, um, the biological viral spray uh, coming right. out of California. The seed there, treatment. The, the seed treatments. Are, seed treatment. There are yes, and in fact, in the F and in our work at FAO, we will actually be listing the active ingredients. Uh, their policy is not to uh, list brand names. Sure. But, um, yes, there are there are uh, safer ingredients that can be used. Yes. What are do you, uh, off off the top of your head? Do you know what a couple? I know there's a litany of AIs that um, treat this pest in the U.S. Are there are there ones that are most applicable to sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia? Well, it's, it's, I think I probably would need some time to get back to you on the specific chemistries, 
I will say that there are uh, there are effective Bacillus thuringiensis. This is a biopesticide that your audience may be familiar with. This is commonly used in um, organic produce development. It's a, a, in our country. If you're buying vegetables, it's a good chance that BT is or some other biopesticide has been sprayed on it. Uh, so that's one. I mean, there are their interest in other biopesticides and some of the new chemistries I would need to get you to, you know, more specific information on in terms of, uh, of the chemicals there. Sure. But I mean, it's they're in the families. There's the, you know, uh, parathrins and uh, this, this kind of thing that they're, they're not. Some of them are brand new. Some of the ones that are being used are less new, but effective. So what is, um, could, could you characterize the adoption? You know, we're, we're just getting some of these guidelines and IPM um, protocols into the value chain through the agro dealers down to the farm level. Right. Um, wh what's the response been like uh, and how is it working so far? I believe that, that we are making progress each year on that. Uh, each year, people are a little bit better prepared, a little more familiar, and have better access to uh, to what's happening. One of the challenges, as I said, with this pest is to understand where and the, how severe the outbreaks are. We do we do have some work in a digital approach to try to track these outbreaks with colleagues at Pennsylvania State University. Uh, that kind of information is is really helpful in getting a sense for the extent but then also the severity uh that that those two things uh taken together but that it is variable we do see it be a problem in an, one location one year and less so in another uh and so the, and so there's some i guess you could say capriciousness about it uh, but i believe i mean clearly I think countries where we have more private sector activity, uh, for example, Kenya, uh, South Africa, uh, you see some of these, uh, Ethiopia is taking it very seriously. Uh, you see uh, uh, probably greater awareness and uptake of uh, the kinds of control methods that we're proposing. The germplasm piece, there's a built-in lag in terms of you know, getting this new seed except for some of the biotech seed. But even there, we're working with uh, seven countries in the region uh, in collaborative and with private sector partners to develop, uh, the hap in, with those countries in the lead to develop resistant varieties that are also, by the way, resistant to drought tolerant, uh, more mm -hmm. drought tolerant, which is a, a huge issue in sub-Saharan Africa maize production. So it's a, I would say, and then in Asia, I think, Generally speaking, it's a, a, a better situation because the national and private sector institutions are stronger. They've got better established means of getting information out, probably more sophisticated value chains. Uh, so I think I think you are seeing rap, more rapid adoption of uh, informed control approaches in places like India, Thailand, Vietnam countries that are uh, better positioned to adapt to an invest. So we just have a few minutes left. Um, could you talk maybe a little bit about how programs like these um, are introducing new good agricultural practices or standards for emerging economies? Um, it, are, are programs like these helping to modernize production systems for um, the slew of pests that we that are known and unknown that we'll have to face in the coming years. I mean, you hit you hit the nail on the head there in terms of one of the big challenges. You don't want to just lurch from pest to pest, right? We know these these kinds of problems occur both with insects and diseases, and or weeds even. And uh, so, it, it, we do very much try to work in a in a way that to use the word systemic, uh, to try to, to, to build that capacity while we do this, but also to link it to that broader effort of understanding around good agricultural practices, clean seed, better post-harvest storage, 
a whole range of things that are going to have a positive effect. So yeah, it, it has to be that way. And I think we talk about that a lot because of course, sometimes um, you have a, a threat like this and people mobilize. Locusts are a great example, right? I mean, we hadn't had locust plagues for a long time, partly because the control was working so well. And you know, this past year, because of the war in Yemen, they weren't able to do that, that those early control methods. Mm -hmm. But but to, to, you, to you you don't want to just you want to have something that becomes makes the whole system more resilient, and that involves the public and private sector, it involves farmer organizations. You know anything you do that um, succeeds and adds value for people, you know, increases efficiency, lowers costs. Um, using less active ingredient, whatever it happens to be, um, these kinds of things have a positive effect on a system that's then better able to stay connected because it's delivering value and it's getting good information in and it's integrating innovation out of, uh, out of R&D. And that can come, as you pointed out, I mean, the private sector has a big role here. So does the public sector in some of the areas like uh, seeds and uh, biological control generally speaking is more of a, uh, a, a public good um, the other thing that's a challenge here is just on some of these uh, approaches is the, the knowledge content is very demanding you know planting a seed is one thing managing you know pest releases and, 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 and timing them and so forth can be or pheromone traps uh, quite a Quite a different undertaking, but yeah, I, I uh, we're 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 continuing to make progress in that space. Fantastic, Dr. Bertram. We're out of time, but uh, we'll have to have you on again to uh, talk more about this incremental improvement. Thank you very much for your insights today. It's my, been my pleasure, and I really appreciate the community's interest uh, in, in this issue, both locally and globally. Good luck to you. Thank you.